Hi, everyone. Welcome to Humane Voices, the official podcast of the Humane Society of the United States. Carrie and Austin back for more talking all animals. Um, Carrie, every time I ask, how are you? Things get crazier and crazier. So I'm just not going to maybe yeah. just avoid, <laughs> avoid that yeah, uh, nowadays. Just, yeah, it's one of those, those periods where you just don't ever ask what's next because there will be an answer. Yeah. I mean, I think all of us just uh, we're hoping people are staying safe from the virus um, while they're out pro like protesting for justice. I, I yeah. just there's so much going on in this country and around the world right now. Um, just hoping that we can turn things on, on so many levels uh, to a better place. Absolutely. Right. Well, um, on, on a bit of a, of a tangential, but a very exciting conversation, we are lucky to uh, have PJ Smith today on the episode. He is the fashion policy director at the Humane Society of the United States. Uh, he's joining us to sit down and chat. PJ, we are so glad you're here. Uh, thanks for, for coming and talking with us today about creating a, a fur-free future. And I just want to be really clear that when, when, when we introduce someone as a fashion director, or he did not make the choice about Austin and my t-shirts today. That is, that is <laughs> beyond hope, it was so us. please don't blame him. Yeah, that was, that was all us. I think they look great. <laughs> well, they're for free, PJ, so at least we're good on that front. I'll just start with, I don't know anything about fashion. Um, <laughs> no idea how I got into this world, but um, here I am, a fashion policy director. Well, that's actually a good way to segue into this. For those um, you know, that aren't too familiar with our work um, in, in policy work and uh, promoting um, you know, our work with fur-free initiatives, can you explain uh, the day-to-day -day for your work? Sure. So I, I, let me go back a little bit of how the, the fur-free campaign really got started at the Humane Society. Um, we were really in like two, year 2000, we were really um, charging or leading the charge on trying to get dog and cat fur mm -hmm. banned from the imported in the United States. And so we helped pass the Cat and Dog Protection Act, uh, which banned any sort of cat and dog fur from coming into the United States. Fast forward till 2005, we saw this footage coming out of China where this species called a raccoon dog was being skinned alive at a, a wildlife market in, in China. Gosh. And we started wondering, what is this raccoon dog? And how is it coming into the United States? Because like I mentioned, we previously worked on the Cat and Dog Protection Act. And the more we started digging, we, we were realizing that we saw this species called raccoon dog coming into the United States as fin raccoon. Um, raccoon, which is a very different species, uh, Murmansky, Tanuki, uh, and what was worse is we started seeing retailers advertise this species, this fur, as faux fur. And we did a little more digging and realized there was a loophole in the federal legislation that said if the value of the fur was less than $150, it didn't have to be on the label. So, I mean, everything has to be on the label, acrylic, cotton, polyester, and except fur. And at this time, what was really popular was this fur trim or palms on hats, which is definitely value. This is like maybe a couple dollars for a trim on a, on a jacket. So it didn't have to be on the label. And when a copywriter that's putting something online says, okay, sees fur, um, they look at the label and they don't see anything. They're like, okay, must be faux fur. Mm -hmm. So we started buying it, we started testing it, and we realized that this was a huge problem. And thankfully, um, we, we were able to work with a lot of retailers and, and, and work with legislators to eventually, uh, President Obama signed the Truth and Fur Labeling Act in 2010, which just closed that loophole. And mm -hmm. at the same time, we were able, because we were working on this federal legislation and, and working with retailers and brands, because we could all agree that consumers should have the right information. And this gave us an opportunity to really have our foot in the door with um, some of the biggest brands out there, some of the biggest retailers. And at that point, it was just education, um, working with them. And so when, when you asked what my day-to-day, 
work is it's it's a lot just working with a lot of these brands um on a whole bunch of stuff so fur is mainly um what we work on but um i get questions every day about uh exotic skins or different um welfare issues with a wool or down um and these are all issues that that humane society of the united states helps helps brands with and um, again, it's just really based on education. And um, now our work is, is focused on uh, passing these fur sales bans in cities and states across the country. So we're working on that a lot. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. PJ, that's great. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask about, um, my recollection when I first started at HSUS was that the, the cat and dog fur situation, I mean, I think that some, some listeners may not even be aware that that was a thing. And maybe you could talk about that a little bit. But my, my recollection was there was some labeling. I mean, this labeling thing goes back through the fur issue a long time, not only in terms of what has to be on a label, but of, of some labels being inaccurate and misleading. Um, and and so what was the, my, my recollection was when we were working on this back in like the early 2000s, there was stuff coming in that was actually cat and dog fur that would be labeled as faux fur or not labeled at all. And that people had no idea that they were buying. Is that, yeah. am I remembering correctly? Um, well, this would be before my time. So, um, <laughs> oh no, I'm dating <laughs> you myself. You would know better than me. <laughs> Um, but I do know, I mean, in the office from a lot of those early investigations, we used to have these, these sort of trinkets. And they even mm. had, it, it was really unbelievable, but what was really popular were these sort of statues that looked like cats. Mm -hmm. And they would have fur on it. And a lot of the tests revealed that the fur was actually cat fur. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I remember they actually sold some of those at the 7-Eleven down from our office, which yeah. I remember seeing and I was just like, oh no, man, you have hit the wrong market for, for these little things to be at the 7-Eleven. Yeah. I think they were rapidly not, not there anymore because I'm sure some of our staff went and had a, a nice conversation with them to let them know what they were selling. Yeah, it wasn't, I mean, I think it was less than t 10 years ago now that we still found um, dog fur um, being imported into the United States. And wow. so, um, the issue hasn't gone away completely. We could, we could always do better in, in making sure that these products don't come into the United States. But um, when you are importing fur, there's always going to be a chance that it's from an endangered species. Like there's, there's constant investigations that are showing that uh, the illegal wildlife trade is, is still a big deal here in the United States. And so is dog and cat fur. So um, I, I believe that more of these sort of state bans on the sale of furs is going to help that because then you're not gonna have anything available on the market that, that is associated with the, the cruelty and the illegal wildlife trade. EJ, what animals, I just feel like cat and dog fur is uh, not my first thought of, but what animals are used for fur that you see in your work? So the main species and the majority of fur, just to start with, comes from these huge fur factory farms. Um, thousands and thousands of rows of cages um, where animals that are undomesticated um, are kept in these small cages. and to think about it like these are a fox when you see a fox out in the wild or um, a mink. Um, foxes like to dig, they run miles and miles and they're, they're very fearful of humans. Same with mink, they uh, are semi-aquatic so they spend a majority of their life near or around water and so you take away some of these natural behaviors and it kind of leads to them just going insane. That's where you start seeing self-mutilation, you start seeing stereotypical behavior like pacing back and forth and um, cannibalism is, is quite common in some of these big fur farms. So the main species by far is um, mink that are raised and killed for fur followed by foxes and raccoon dogs. And then um, we say over a hundred million animals are raised and killed for fur uh, every year and the majority of those three species. Um, in the United States, little something that people don't quite realize is we're the number one trapping country in the world. Um, we go back and forth between Canada and that main species is uh, coyote mainly, but there's fox species and, and 
um, muskrat and raccoon, um, some of these uh, animals that you see in the, in the wild. And that makes up around uh, 10 to 15 percent of the entire industry coming out of the United States. The rest is all farmed. Um, but we not, we're not even including rabbit fur in um, a lot of those numbers. And if we do, we're looking at to upwards towards a billion animals that are raised and killed for fur every year. Sometimes, like I remember a while ago, um, you know, there's sometimes when you pick up faux fur and you can immediately tell that it's faux. And there are other times when it's, it's become increasingly hard to tell. Um, and I know that we have, um, we have some processes that we use at work for testing that and like, but if you're a general consumer and you don't have access to the kind of equipment that you, you can actually see that this is a biological product versus a, a synthetic product, how, how can you tell as a consumer if you're like looking at a, at a piece of like, if you're buying a coat but, and you don't wanna be supporting fur, like what can you do to kind of feel and inspect the item visually to know that that is in fact labeled accurately and you're not getting fur? Sure. That, that's a really good point. I mean, we've had to do so much testing over the years to, mm -hmm. to know, and, and it, it's, I've gotten so good that I can go to a store and look and be like, that's faux from mm -hmm. feet away, or that's real fur. But the, the main ways that we um, advise people to tell for themselves is the first one is tapering. So going to like a fine needle or like a whisker, going to a point, um, faux fur hasn't been able to do that yet. Mm. It has more of a blunt edge. If you like take it over and put it on a, a white piece of paper, you'll see that it, the edge is more blunt and not tapered like a needle. Um, one of the ways to tell, and we, we ask you not to do this in the store, wait for you to maybe take it home at that point, but um, to burn a little bit of the hair to maybe pluck <laughs> like one or two. I see why you don't want to do it in the store. <laughs> yeah, don't do it in <laughs> the <laughs> store. <laughs> Just gonna send matches to the to the coats. In I just yeah. want to try yeah. before I buy. I'm sure you're fine with that. <laughs> um, yeah. But the um, it, one will smell like hair burn, and the other one will smell like plastic. And then the third way is to just pull the hair apart uh, and get to really the as close to the base as you can. Mm. There's going to be skin, and the other one's going to be a more of a netted backing. Um, yeah. Those are the three main ways, but it is getting very very difficult. Um, faux fur, now that so many companies are going fur free, um, California, maybe we'll talk about that later, banned fur sales, there is this investment that's going into the faux fur industry um, that is not just making it so you can't tell the difference, but it's making it so this faux fur is, is like biodegradable and good for the environment because we know that that's, that's important for consumers as well. Um, the latest one, it's called Coba Fur, uh, done with Stella McCartney, but it's corn based. So the majority of it's like made out of corn and then recycled polyester makes up the rest. And so it's, they're, they're constantly improving that. And I think we're going to have a 100% biodegradable plant based faux fur in not in the near future, in the near future. Wow, that's really interesting. I, I can, so I'd love for you to talk a little bit about some of the, you mentioned the sort of environmental issues, and I know there are some around fur production, but one of the things um, I was curious, you know, if, if we're getting to the point where we're getting these faux furs that are like so close to the real thing, does that present challenges too? I mean, as long as the sort of fur industry is out there, does that, does that mean that con consumers are going to have to be extra careful in terms of what they're buying, in terms of knowing what they're getting? Sure. I mean, I think if there's, if you are nervous about anyone thinking that your fur is real, we recommend throwing a fur free pin on it, which yeah, you know, the right. HSUS one's always a favorite of, of uh, advocates because it's a nice heart and it just has no fur on it. I would think uh, the brands would want to do that too. They'd want to brag about it. Yeah. I mean, it's Stella McCartney on her, it's like on the outside of the jacket it says fur free fur. Mm. But um, yeah, no, it's, it's a concern. That's why I think these first sales bans are, are important as well, because you're going to take away that market completely and everyone just won't even have to question it. They're just going to know that it's either um, vintage fur, which a lot of these first sales bans do have an exemption for vintage fur. Um, so you go to the thrift store and there's going to be um, an older fur or used fur that, that people will still be able to buy. Um, but as well, um, faux fur will just be 
easier, better for the environment, and it's going to be a no-brainer for consumers that you just you'll assume everyone's wearing faux fur at one point. I hope. Yeah, yeah. it's the goal. Uh, PJ, yeah. so what what is the current strategy? You mentioned you've you've touched on education, touched a little bit on you know corporate relationships and and policy changes there, but how are we fighting the use of fur in fashion now? Well, you 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 said them both. I mean those. Okay really driving the force right now. The, um, the idea that being good uh, for animals is marketable now for a lot of brands, um, same as being good for the environment and human rights. Uh, people want to uh, know that the products they buy aren't associated with animal cruelty and the, the fashion industry is, is, is catching up quickly um, with some other industries on this. And so um, they know when we worked with Gucci to announce its fur free policy, that was one of its most liked Instagram posts of all time. When Prada, when we worked with Prada to go fur free, that was at the time, it was their most liked tweet at the time. And so companies that want to reach the next generation of consumers, that Gen Z that really cares about these issues, cares about the environment, cares about animals. They know that that's the way to reach them, where these brands know that they can do good by doing, they can do well by doing good. I was mm. up. Um, but they can also um, reach their, that next generation of consumers that are gonna have the buying power in the near future. So that's, that's the first part. And that's what I think really drove um, a, a lot of where we are today is the, the corporate reform. Um, these big brands saying we will no longer be selling fur. That kind of led to the public policy side. And that's, that's where we, we started seeing cities in California, like San Francisco and Los Angeles banning fur sales, which eventually led to California last year become the first state in the nation to ban fur sales. And we know right before COVID-19 hit, there was uh, a lot of um, movement in Minneapolis, the, uh, the next fur-free city, uh, Rhode Island and Hawaii introduced fur sales bans. So we knew it was uh, picking up, but unfortunately a lot of that has stalled at this point. But I, I think that there's still going to be a desire to do that moving forward. Mm. Those are, I think, the UK, our, our colleagues in the UK are trying to make um, Britain the, the, the first fur free country. Mm. And I yeah. think they have a lot That's of support amazing. there as well. That's so um, I think it's just going to take off from there. So PJ, we've got another thing um, happening at this particular moment, along with all the issues around the cruelty of fur and, and the sort of environmental degradation that it causes. I mean, there's, there's a moment happening right now that we're all impacted by uh, related to coronavirus. And my understanding is that there have been some connections between fur farms and, and the, this issue that we're all dealing with right now. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, it's, it's developing now. This is a um, pretty big development where in the Netherlands, uh, about a month ago, we started seeing these mink come down with that tested positive for the coronavirus. Um, they had higher uh, mortality rates and they had respiratory problems. And so they tested them and they all came down, tested positive for COVID-19. And this started taking off in fur farms in the Netherlands. I think at this point, we're up to nine fur farms, mink fur farms that have tested positive for COVID-19. And recently two employees have gotten sick from mink. The, the, mm -hmm. the government has actually said that it is very likely that the humans um, that mink transmitted COVID-19 to humans and this would be the first time animal to human transmission has happened since the likely the origin mm -hmm. of uh, the virus to begin with and so at this point the Dutch government has um, said that it's extremely likely they're testing all farms now and they are potentially looking at um, calling the animals that are on some of these fur farms mm -hmm. and that's all still waiting to be decided at this point but um, the good news is the Netherlands already banned 
for farming. They just gave an ex a very long phase out period. So they mm -hmm. for farming in 2013. And again, Netherlands at one point was the third largest fur farming country in the mm -hmm. world. And they banned fur farming in 2013 with an 11 year phase out. So mm -hmm. 2024, there will be no fur farms in the Netherlands. Wow. Um, so yeah, it's, it's the first time it's, I mean, a direct link between an industry that keeps these animals in filthy conditions in these huge fur factory farms. Um, it just shows how fast this disease can spread. Um, not just amongst mink at now nine different farms and they're still testing more farms, but to humans. So there's a real risk that some of these industries like the fur industry um, can, can could be the, the um, origin of the next pandemic. Mm. Uh, these mink are going to be, even if humans, the, the COVID-19 situation um, gets better and, and infections start to decline, these fur farms are still going to be reservoirs um, for the spread of the disease, spread of COVID-19. And so I think we, the Humane Society has taken a very strong stand and we're, we're asking for uh, fur farms to be banned or closed down everywhere to mm -hmm. avoid the next pandemic that has hit us all so hard. And I'm glad that you mentioned kind of that origin because I can't help but see a lot of similarities between fur farms and wet markets. I mean, it seems very that these two reservoirs, like you said, for infectious diseases. I mean, it's, it, only, it seems like a matter of time until some, some outbreak happens. So it, it's, it's yet another case study that you're bringing up, PJ. Yeah, the foxes and raccoon dogs, which I mentioned before from that live skinning, um, they're quite common sites at wet markets in the wildlife trade in China. They, I saw numbers, and this is from the Chinese government, said that the, of the wildlife trade, 75% of it comes from the value of it is the fur trade. And they tested raccoon dogs and foxes at wildlife markets in China in 2003 and 2004, right after the SARS outbreak. And both of them tested positive for SARS. So there was, I think the origin of SARS was finally given to, or not given to, but um, pointed at civets as the mm. main origin from that or that host. And the infectious disease expert of Germany um, said that the amount of raccoon dogs that were on some of these wildlife markets in China, right next to civets, um, it's, and that they, they tested positive for SARS too, that there's a really good chance that raccoon dogs were also a host um, for SARS. So there's, there's plenty of uh, evidence showing that the fur trade in general, not just, I mean, so many of these different industries that keep animals um, in these conditions, but the fur industry especially um, is a, a possible source for a lot of these, at least in the next one, the next big pandemic as well. PJ, thank you so much for, for joining us for the chat. Um, was there any other uh, final words before we wrapped up the episode? I think it was a great look at the work that we're doing. Um, great the and horrible. Of the work that, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, that we have to, uh, you know, it, but it's, it's extremely necessary, you know, and so we just thank you so much. Was there, was there anything else that you wanted to add before uh, we wrap up today? If you buy fur, if you sell fur, you're complicit into this in this cruelty and i think it's 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 on us to really lead that charge to make sure that this industry is is ended once and for all and i think when i started i, I didn't think it was possible but the amount of um, progress that we've made in the last 10 years I, I am confident that we'll see the end of the fur trade in my life and and so that keeps me keeps me going. And yet part of me is really shocked that this thing is still happening, you know, like, cause I remember when I first got into this, I was like, oh yeah, fur, I can't believe anyone still wears this, wears this stuff. And I know it's decreased a lot and I'm grateful for that, but man, I just can't believe anyone's still wearing it. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, I, I'm very fascinated with the history um, aspect of advocacy within fashion and mm -hmm. watch it go from you know, the 80s and 90s, where a lot of people thought we, we ended this trade because you saw 
billboards and and celebrities were coming out against it. Um, but the industry is cyclical, just like trends are in, in fashion. And mm -hmm. um, you'll see for for be popular, and then you'll see it decrease. And um, not to less than ten years ago, it was at the highest numbers it's ever been. Um, and one thing that I so how are we ending it? How are we making sure that it's just not going to come back? And and that's where these corporate policies and these public policies, these fur sales bans are, are crucial moving forward because no matter what, even if that aesthetic look comes back, if say we the fur trim on a jacket or something like that comes back in 10 years, um, they still won't be able to sell it in mm -hmm. certain states and certain cities and hopefully uh, globally at one point. And, and the faux fur options are going to be so good that you can have that trend, you can have that look, um, and it doesn't have to come from an animal. Uh, PJ Smith, again, Fashion Policy Director at the Humane Society of the United States. Thanks again for being on the show. Um, be sure to follow the HSUS and HSI on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and the website humanesociety.org for the latest info. And you can also message podcast at humanesociety.org and send us your reactions, questions you have, and topics that you want to hear for our next episode. See you next time on Humane Voices. Stay safe, Thanks, everybody. Guys.